You know, in, in, in Sleeping Beauty, you know, Sleeping Beauty goes to sleep. And the reason she goes to sleep is because you, you have to remember what happens is she has parents who are quite old. And so they're pretty desperate to have a child, like so many people are now. And they only have one child, like so many people do now. And they, they don't want anything to happen to this child. Because like, hey, it's a miracle. And there's only one of them. And so and she's the princess. And so it's like, we're not letting anything around her. So they have a big christening party, right? And they invite everybody. But they don't invite Maleficent. And Maleficent is the terrible mother. She's nature. She's like the thing that goes bump in the night. She's the devil herself, so to speak. She's everything that you don't want your child to encounter. So the king and queen saying, well, we just won't invite her to the christening. It's like, well, good luck with that. That's an Oedipal story, right? The Oedipal mother is the mother who devours her child by refusing, by overprotecting him or her. So that instead of being strengthened by an encounter with the terrible world, they're weakened by too much protection. And then when they're let out into the world, they cannot live. And that's the story of Sleeping Beauty. And that's what the king and queen do. And they apologize to, the, to Maleficent when she first shows up. And say, well, you know, they have a bunch of half-witted excuses why they don't invite her. We forgot. It's like, I don't think so. You know, you don't forget something like that. And she kind of makes that point. It's right, the whole horror of life. You don't forget about that when you have a child, that's for sure. You might wish that it would stay at bay, but you do not forget about it. The question is, do you invite it to the party? And the answer is, it bloody well depends how unconscious you want your child to be. And if you want your child to be unconscious, well, then you have the added advantage that maybe they won't leave home and so you can take advantage of them for the rest of your sad life instead of going off to find something to do for yourself. Well, and then, you, of course, you can take revenge on them if they do have any, any, what would you call, impetus towards courage that you sacrificed yourself 30 years ago and want to stamp out as soon as you see it develop in your child. That's another thing that would be quite pleasant. And so that's what happens in Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, well, none of this is pleasant and nothing that happens in that story is pleasant. So Sleeping Beauty, she's naive as hell. They put her out in the forest and have her raised by these three, like, goody-two-shoes fairies that are also completely devoid of any real potency and power, right? There's no, nothing Maleficent about them. And then the first idiot prince that wanders by, she falls in love with so badly that she has post-traumatic stress disorder when he rides off on his horse, right? That's what happens. And then she, then she goes into the castle and she's all freaked out because she met the love of her life for like five minutes, for God's sake. And, you know, that's when the spinning wheel, that's the wheel of fate, pops up and she pricks her finger, right? They try to get rid of all the spinning wheels. They try to get rid of all the wheels of fate with their pointed end. But she finds it, poked, pricks her fingers and finger and falls down unconscious. Well, she wants to be unconscious. And no bloody wonder. She was protected her whole life. She's so damn naive that her first love affair just about kills her. She wants to go to sleep and never wake up. And so that's exactly what happens. And then she has to wait for the prince to come and rescue her. Well, you think, how sexist can you get that story? Well, seriously, because that's... That's the way that that would be read in, in, in the modern world. It's like she doesn't need a prince to rescue her. That's why Disney made Frozen that absolutely appalling piece of rubbish. <laughs> so, you know, you can say, you can say, well, the princess doesn't need a prince to rescue her, but, you know, that's a boneheaded way of looking at the story because the prince isn't just a man who's coming to rescue the woman. And believe me, he's got his own problems, right? He's got a whole goddamn dragon he has to contend with. But, <laughs> but the prince also represents the woman's own consciousness. The consciousness is presented very frequently in stories as symbolically masculine, as it is with the Logos idea. And the idea is that without, without that forward-going, courageous consciousness, a woman herself will drift into unconsciousness and terror. And so you can read it as, well, the woman who's sleeping needs a man to wake her up. And of course, just like a man needs a woman to wake him up, it's the same damn thing. That's the dragon fight in Sleeping Beauty. But it's also the case that if she's only unconscious, all she can do is lay there and sleep, like the, the sleep of the naive and damned. She has to wake, and, wake herself up and, 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 and bring her own consciousness, her own masculine consciousness into the forefront so that she can survive in the world. And of course, women are trying to do that like mad, but that's partly what's represented in a story like that. And that's partly what's implicit in this idea, is that unless the woman is taken out of man, so to speak, then she isn't a human being, she's just a creature. And that's partly what's embedded in this story. So you don't want to read it as a patriarchal... You don't want to read anything that way. It's so... Really, it's... It really, it's... Yeah, I won't, 
I won't bother with that, but really, we can do better than that, man. 